nice and, and so nice. Uh, my thanks to you. Um, tonight, uh, oh, one thing about uh, as we move forward, we're here next week with the Urban Mechanics from the City of Boston. And, uh, for those of you who have not uh, encountered them before, they are uh, the uh, in City Hall group that has been using data to improve uh, the delivery of, of city services. And as I think most uh, folks know, Mayor Walsh is the first mayor in the city's history to have a set of dashboards up in his office where he can kind of assess what's going on on a regular basis. And um, tonight's presentation relates in part to Cedric. Um, she's uh, often in the background uh, around these kinds of things, but that's only because she's the one out there doing the work. <laughs> Um, and, and so it, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, her and she will introduce our speakers. Um, our goal is to have a lively conversation about these three areas and with that, I turn it over to Alicia. Thanks. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, so you'll see my uh, talk is entitled Assessing Employment Training and Housing Programs I'll play in three acts because Ted gave me a really broad mandate here and I ran with it. Um, so I think what we'll do is uh, I'll talk first about employment, that's act one, and then we'll turn to our panelists and we'll have a discussion, and then we'll go to act two and then act three and so forth. So I'm not up here lecturing all the time. Um, but let me introduce our panelists. Um, first is Chris Mannion. Um, he is from Wayfair. And uh, Chris is here to tell us more about what Wayfair is doing in terms of employment opportunities that addresses our first topic um, that you'll see. So thanks for coming, Chris. Um, second, we have Katie Gall. Um, she is the uh, Deputy Director of the Office of Workforce Development at the City of Austin. You'll see their logo on two out of three things I'm going to show you tonight. Um, and so Katie's going to be able to speak to uh, some of the things that the city is doing around employment and training. And then last but not least, we have Callie Clark. Callie's an alum of the Policy School. Woo -hoo! Um, Callie is uh, uh, the co-director of the Data Center at the Massachusetts Housing Partnership. And so Callie will be telling us more about uh, what's uh, brewing in terms of housing policy at the state level and um, also what MHC hears around uh, community development being done as well. Okay, so um, act number one uh, there, as I mentioned, is going to be about employment. And um, the report that you see listed there on the left-hand side was just released by the Office of Workforce Development last Wednesday. So uh, you can find it online if you are really thirsting for more knowledge. Act two will be about training, and they're going to focus on an evaluation that I've been doing with the City of Boston for the last several years on their summer jobs program. And that was in a report that the city released um, uh, almost two years ago. And then Act 3 um, will be about housing. And as you'll see there, um, that's actually that report card cover is from several years ago. Um, and that's because you're going to get a little bit of a preview of some of the stuff we're going to be putting in the Greater Boston Housing Report Card that'll be released by the Boston Foundation this summer. So um, keep that under your hats. I'll be very in trouble with the Boston Foundation if, if, if tweets or pictures come out. No, I'm just kidding. OK, so um, the first topic we're going to talk about today um, uh, talks about employment. So the, I'm sure you know the, the person in the center. If you don't, she's not going to give you a car. Um, <laughs> but does anyone know who the other two people are up there? Larry Ellison and Jody Adams. Um, what, what do these three people have in common? None of them have a college degree. Ha ha. Um, so on the left hand side, oh, actually that's Bar Barbara Lynch, sorry, that's not Jody Adams. But very close, the same as Chef from Boston. Um, Barbara Lynch actually never went to college. Um, uh, you'll see Oprah dropped out of Tennessee State um, when she got her first job offer. Uh, and Larry Ellison dropped out several times, I think, um, as he uh, tried his hand at college, and then he decided he liked being a computer programmer um, and never went back, and so Harvard Business School uh, named him Entrepreneur of the Year in 1990. Um, and what's really interesting is that you'll see that these uh, three areas in terms of um, the restaurant business, 
uh, even entertainment, uh, as well as especially IT and software, are definitely areas where you'll find lots of non-VA workers, so folks maybe not this famous and making this much money. Uh, but the point being that uh, non-VA workers obviously can be quite successful. Okay, so why was this report important? Um, I had several reporters ask me this last Wednesday. Um, uh, one of the reasons or the motivations for doing this report was that um, we've been in a period of uh, tremendous prosperity over the last several, uh, over the last you know five years, seen tremendous job growth. We're down to 2.8 percent in terms of unemployment. Uh, wages are finally rising, but the prosperity is not shared equally across the entire Greater Boston area. Um, and there's kind of a misnomer, I think, about Greater Boston that it runs only on college graduates, which is not entirely true. Um, so we're gonna show you some, some data behind that. Um, the other thing is that we use uh, some really novel sources of data to be able to look at this. So we're using um, not just your usual data sources like the census and the ACS, but we went out and we scraped resumes off the web to look at the actual skills of people uh, without a bachelor's degree to compare them with people who do have a bachelor's degree. And then we use job posting data to actually match those skills up to what employers are demanding. And then finally, uh, we offer a bunch of recommendations based on the data. So the one thing I love about working with the Walsh administration is that everything has to start with data and it's very data driven. Um, and some of these uh, recommendations are in terms of how we can give sort of um, the right training to workers to develop their skills. But in each case, we want to make sure that the skills uh, that we are um, developing in people are ones that are in demand, right? Obviously, this won't work unless uh, we have employers uh, on our side. So for me, this um, question actually started uh, with this picture, which came from some other research I had done previously. Um, what is this showing you? So you'll see on the um, y-axis there, I'm looking at the share of job postings that require a bachelor's degree or higher. That's on that left figure there. Um, and on uh, the other axis, we're measuring the unemployment rate. So you can see during the Great Recession, there's a tremendous increase in the share of jobs that were requiring a bachelor's degree. Um, and also, you can see here that there's a similar increase in the share of postings that were requiring four or more years of experience. What's less well known is that then this happened. Okay, so as the unemployment rate decreased, employers were less likely to ask for a bachelor's degree, less likely to ask for four or more years of experience. Why is this happening? Probably most people in this room would figure it out, but we had to write two academic papers to convince people this was true, that when the labor market is tight, uh, or when the labor market is loose and there's lots of unemployed workers, right, that means that employers can be picky. Right? They can go out and look for the best candidate, and why wouldn't they go out and look for the best candidate that's out there? Right. So during the Great Recession, there's lots of unemployed college-educated workers. You could put a requirement for a bachelor's degree on an administrative assistant job and get hundreds of applications. Right. When the labor market starts to tighten, we see that employers um, drop some of those skill requirements because they are having a hard time filling those jobs. And we'll talk a little bit more about what are those skills uh, that we're talking about. So the big point here is that employers respond to the number and type of workers that are available in the labor market. And so the whole idea that college is for all or that college is a requirement is somewhat of a myth, right? Because employers will adjust uh, when they can. Uh, so what, what did we do? We looked at the characteristics of VA versus non-VA workers. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Um, here's an example of, say, the resumes that we collected online. We used um, a very popular platform that I'm not going to name because uh, we scraped the data off the web. And so they're not the most litigious um, group, but we, we don't really advertise this. Um, and what did we do? We actually scraped off these where they're listing their key skills. Um, so when people list skills on their resume, we scraped those words off of the resumes um, and then we associated it with whatever education um, uh, degree that they had listed. And then we did um, the same thing for job postings, although here we were able to take a shortcut. We just use a data set that's put together by Burning Glass Technologies, where they actually go out and scrape all the job postings and make it into nice data for us. So you can see where the innovation here is we're not just looking to see how many people have a bachelor's degree or how many uh, people have an associate's degree, et cetera. We're actually looking at the skills that people list or that they say that they have um, or that employers are demanding. Okay, so where do non-VA workers fit into Boston's labor force? Uh, so not too surprisingly, here the left pie chart is um, 
the educational distribution for Boston. Uh, on the right is the United States. And you'll notice there's a giant uh, part of the pie there that's in that peach color and that pink color. So those are people with a bachelor's or an advanced degree. Those uh, slices are much larger uh, for Boston than they are for the rest of the US. And that's where we get it in our heads that everyone in Boston has a college degree. Although if you add those two pieces together, they're only about 40% of the population. So that means that a little over half of the population um, does not have a college degree, a four-year college degree. Among the rest of the population, the most uh, common degree uh, that's held is a high school degree. So about 23.7% of workers have a high school degree. Another 15% have some college um, education and only 5.4% have an associate's degree. And that's a really important distinction. We're gonna talk about that later when we get to recommendations um, because there's a very low completion rate uh, for community college students. And so um, that's uh, one of the things that if we want to make sure people are getting the right skills, we're gonna have to change. Um, Boston's labor force uh, has actually been growing in a favorable way compared to the US. So on the left-hand side there, we're looking at the annual percent change in the labor force in Boston versus the US. So we have, we've had growth of two, three, four uh, percent per year compared to less than one percent for the rest of the US. And how are we able to do this? The right hand chart shows you um, a lot of it has to do with our reliance on immigration. So immigrants actually fuel most, actually all of our growth in terms of population and labor force. Um, we would actually be suffering a net loss in terms of population and labor force if it were not for immigration. And part of that is because we are an older population, so we have a lower fertility rate compared to other places in the US. And then also, we have really high out migration. So we bring in all these great college students, and they train up, and they get their degrees, and then they go take opportunities all over the world. They don't necessarily all stay here. Um, among working age individuals, those that uh, have a B, are not with a BA, are more likely to be black, Hispanic, Asian, um, in contrast, those who do have a bachelor's degree are overwhelmingly white. So the non-BA workforce is a lot more diverse uh, than the bachelor's degree workforce. Upwards of 20% of non-BA workers um, are naturalized citizens, another 20% um, are not US citizens, and that means that English is gonna be a key skill here that we're gonna have to be thinking about. So making sure that people um, have English skills because that leads to uh, jobs that have higher wages. Um, Non-VA workers have less favorable labor market outcomes, probably not too surprisingly. They're much less likely to even be in the labor force. Um, they have, uh, they're much more likely to work part-time rather than full-time. And then they have incomes that are 30 to 70% less than those with a bachelor's degree. And because of that, a quarter of individuals uh, with a high school degree are living in households in poverty, and a third of individuals that have an associate's degree are living in households below the poverty line. So there's a high rate of poverty among those without a bachelor's degree. How do the occupation distributions of people with a bachelor's degree uh, versus those without match up? So here along the x-axis, um, I have all the major occupation groupings. The purple bars are non-VA workers. The pink bars are VA workers. You can see bachelor's degree recipients are much more likely to be working in management occupations, business and financial um, occupations. If we look to the right, non-VA workers are much more likely to be working in um, office and administrative occupations, food preparation, et cetera. But there is that area of overlap that I put in um, that red box there, where when you think about a set of occupations like in IT, um, in engineering, in uh, physical and social sciences, um, legal occupations, education, where we can see some overlap between the two groups. However, that's not what people are training for. So um, this is showing you the distribution of certificates and associate's degrees by their field of study. So I just told you, <laughs> where do you wanna be? You wanna be in healthcare, you wanna be in IT, you wanna be in those STEM occupations. So we've gotten the word out about healthcare, Right, so if you look at health professions and related programs, that's 20% of certificates, and it's about 20% of associate's degrees, so that's great. But when we look at the other STEM occupations, like engineering and IT, they're only about 5%. So they're really ranking low at the bottom of that distribution, and that's where a lot of the opportunity is. Okay, 
So how do the skills of people without a bachelor's degree match up to those with a bachelor's degree? So a few caveats are in order. This is all coming off that resume data, which means that we're really only capturing um, people who are looking for a job, <laughs> people are looking for a job on the platform that we scrape stuff off of. Um, and then also, we're only gonna capture the skills they list on their resume. You might have many other skills that you don't list on your <coughs> resume, right? Hopefully there may be more hobbies like culinary or things like that, but um, people might not be listing every single thing. So you have to sort of keep those, those things in mind. And we also needed a way to sort of uh, categorize these skills, right? People list thousands and thousands of skills on their resumes. So what we did was we stole this categorization from Burning Glass Technologies um, to be able to talk about our skills in terms of baseline skills. Those are things like project management, communication, leadership, Specialized skills, those are things like information technology, accounting, bookkeeping, and software skills, which are kind of obvious, things like Python, Oracle, stuff like that. So the first thing to notice is, clearly if you have more education, you're more likely to list skills. So for example, 36.5% of people with a high school diploma list at least one baseline skill on their resume, compared to 50% of people with an associate's degree and 58.9% of people with a bachelor's degree. Right? So that's fairly obvious. But it really varies by the type of skill, right? So if you look across that, they're almost equally likely to list some kind of specialized skill on the resume. But where the biggest divergence happens is in terms of those software skills. And that's gonna be something you're gonna see coming up over and over and over again uh, throughout this presentation. So then we decided to break this down more finely, right? Because just knowing baseline specialized software, that's not really gonna help people in terms of what are the skills they might need to acquire and what maybe the city might want to set up in terms of training programs. So what we did was uh, we looked at the actual skills that they have within a, each of these broad categories. Um, so there you can see in the red is high school, the yellow is uh, some college or an associate's degree, and the blue is a bachelor's degree. And looked at places where there's overlap and where, the, where there's gaps. So in terms of the baseline skills, we see a lot of overlap in terms of management, creativity, multitasking, leadership, et cetera. Where we see most of the gap is down here at the bottom, right? And this actually is even relating to some of those software skills. So that these are more basic software skills than what's in that software category. But for example, if you take that Microsoft Office category, 27% of people with a bachelor's degree um, list Microsoft Office on their resume, compared to only 9% of individuals with an associate's degree and 7% of individuals with high school degrees. So that's where the biggest gaps are in those baseline skills. If we looked at specialized skills, areas of overlap are in things like inventory management, retail sales, product inspection, some engineering, um, HR management, general administrative tasks, right? Some of these things that you could imagine um, apply to the people who are BA and a non-BA. Where we see those gaps in terms of the specialized skills are things like information security, um, marketing, some uh, gaps in terms of people management, um, other gaps in terms of office management, but it's not so clear cut. So in some places, you know, we're seeing people with a high school degree actually are more likely to list the skills. So look at that advanced customer service type thing, right? So um, in some places we see uh, people without a bachelor's degree actually excelling in a particular skill. And then in terms of software skills, there's only four uh, software skills where those with, uh, without a bachelor's degree are even comparable to those with a bachelor's degree. And they're things like networking hardware, cybersecurity, thank goodness, right? Everybody needs to know cybersecurity these days. Um, clinical informatics, version control, but really not very much. And look at how big those gaps are between the blue lines and everything else. So really a lot of the story is playing out in those software skills. And that kind of makes sense, right? So in terms of baseline skills, um, and when we did that, um, that look at how the skills changed over the business cycle, uh, baseline skills were the first thing that got taken off of the resume, or off of the job postings. And that kind of makes sense, because I can teach you project management, right? I can teach you communication, you can develop leadership. Even in terms of those specialized skills, like if you need to know something about information security, I'm sure there's an online course I can send you to, um, or some kind of training that can be developed. But in terms of software skills, if I need you to know Python to do your job, I need you to know that, you know, know that walking in the door day one. That's not as easy for me to develop uh, or to wait for you to take a six month course to develop. So how do the skill requirements, now we're gonna go to the job side of things. So now we're gonna look at all the job postings that Burning Glass collects. 
We're going to look at the skill requirements for a non-VA job versus a VA job in the same occupation. So you might not think about this too much, but the same occupation, let's take administrative assistant, some of those jobs might require a VA and some might not. In fact, if you look at people um, who are administrative assistants, like say in the census or the CPS, 80% of those people do not have a bachelor's degree right now, but if you look at the job postings, 80% of job postings will require one. Why is that? Because <laughs> a VA was not required 20, 30 years ago to be an administrative assistant, right? So these things change over time. So we did the same thing. We categorized these jobs and the skills that are on these jobs, and we see very similar patterns, right? So um, in terms of baseline skills and specialized skills, those are pretty similar requirements for VA versus non-VA jobs. Where the rubber starts to meet the road is in the softer skill category again. Although, you'll notice it's very similar for those with an associate's or a bachelor's degree, right? So for individuals who have some college that's being required, um, we're seeing similar requirements in terms of software skills, less so for those with a high school degree. What's interesting is among the job postings, there's actually a lot more overlap um, between the skills that are required. Um, almost in each of these categories, and certainly in the baseline skills. So a lot of these jobs are um, equally likely to require things like troubleshooting, leadership, verbal communication, multitasking. Everybody, every single job posting will say communication. <laughs> like the most frequently listed thing, right? We all want good communicators to work with. Again, where we're getting those gaps are things like presentation skills, um, planning, research, right? Things that are cognitive skills that need to be developed. In terms of specialized skills, um, a lot of these, a lot of overlap in terms of retail skills, merchandising, um, general sales, a lot of the medical skills are overlapping, like emergency and intensive care. Some of that comes from um, healthcare jobs uh, being very likely to require certificates. So if you need a phlebotomist, you find someone who has a certificate in phlebotomy. You don't look to see if they have a college degree, right? You want to know if they have that particular skill. And in healthcare, we have lots of certificates that tell you if you have that skill. And so that's some of the thinking behind these comparisons is if there's certain skills that uh, non-VA workers are deficient in that would help them get into those VA type jobs, we could think about developing a certificate in, for example, financial reporting or regulation and law compliance. Um, it might be a six week thing, it might be a semester long thing, but if we can develop that kind of certificate and training to fit that requirement, then that non-VA worker can signal, I have this skill, Right, and perhaps fill that job that usually requires a bachelor's degree. A lot less overlap in the software skills. So like I said, that software thing just keeps coming up again and again. It's really being the distinguishing feature. And we have seen some response in the private sector, right, with um, boot camps, right, a lot of these IT boot camps or software boot camps. Um, we have the partnership uh, that Northeastern's developed with Google, right, where Google has developed uh, their own online certification and now Northeastern will recognize that certification as uh, part of the way towards a bachelor's degree. So because uh, I think it's really interesting that we've seen that private sector response exactly where we need it, right, which sort of suggests to me that the, the data is telling us what, what's going on out there. All right, so what happened during the Great Recession? What, what was up with those pictures that I showed you before? Um, here's uh, uh, us comparing uh, the skills that workers had in different occupations before the Great Recession. So those blue bars show you workers who have a bachelor's degree in 2006, the share of them in each one of these occupations. So computer related, drafting, law, uh, life sciences, sales, and secretaries and administrative assistants. So here's getting at that. What did workers need before the recession, before we suddenly jacked up their requirements? And then that red bar shows you the share of job postings that now require a BA in these same occupations. So you can see in almost every one of these occupations, there's been a significant increase, right, in the share of postings requiring a VA, even though the share of workers in those jobs don't necessarily always have a VA. And this is what we call up-credentialing, right, where suddenly I have decided I need somebody with a bachelor's degree. Now sometimes you might actually need that, right? We might have changed the job. So for example, think about medical record uh, keeping, right? That used to be something that was very paper <laughs> intensive and filed away. Now everyone needs to know the EPIC record keeping system walking in the door. If you've been to the doctor recently, you have seen everyone struggling with the EPIC record keeping system. Um, so you know that would be a shift in terms of the skills you're actually looking for 
um, in that individual worker, in that administrative worker, compared to perhaps just wanting a better worker and being able to get that during the recession. So what we did is we took all the skills for a very narrow occupation, this is showing you for administrative assistance, um, to see what's the difference between jobs that only require a BA versus those that don't, and you'll see they all require the same skills, just maybe not the same frequency. But they even require the same skills in the same order, right? So it's not like these jobs are wildly different. Um, where we do see some difference is maybe towards the end here in terms of uh, the BA jobs are more likely to require scheduling, billing and invoicing, things like that. That's where the gaps maybe get long, larger. But again, um, development certificates are showing proficiency in these kinds of things. Maybe this is where the Microsoft Office piece comes in um, to help fill that gap. So what were the recommendations that we came out with um, last week? One was thinking about how can we collaborate with employers uh, in a more meaningful way so we can figure out what skills are in high demand. So I just showed you a snapshot of how BA skills match up to those uh, without a BA, but that's a snapshot. This thing is a moving target, right? And we just saw that these skills can change over the business cycle, they can change um, over decades with new technologies being introduced. So how do we make sure that if we're gonna develop, say, a program for people to learn um, you know, regulation and law compliance, that's not gonna be obsolete in the next month. If you partner with employers, then they're gonna tell you the skills that they need because they wanna fill jobs. And that's something that they really wanna be doing right now. So things like expanding apprenticeship programs into some non-traditional types of occupations, so not just construction and plumbing and things like that, but in IT and healthcare can help. Um, supporting incumbent worker programs, what the heck is that? That's where your employer actually puts together a program um, for people who are working there now to advance their skills into another uh, position, right? To be able to advance within the company. So a lot of the healthcare um, uh, sector has done that in Boston. So for example, um, this is an example from Partners Healthcare program. They've teamed up with Southern New Hampshire University so people can go and get different certificates and move um, from one uh, job to the next, right? And advance in their career within the same firm. Um, making IT training to be more responsive, right? And that's where we get that Grow with Google initiative that I just mentioned. Um, boosting completion rates at community colleges. Remember I told you 15% of the workforce has some college, but only 5% has an associate's degree. That's because the completion rate at community colleges in Boston, what do you think the completion rate is? I'm just curious. How many people do you think when they start college, finish, start community college, finish within three years? It should only be two, but we'll give it to you. What'd you say? 30%, that's, that's actually pretty close. It's 20%. It's pretty low, right? Compared to what, um, I think a BA at state colleges is at least 50%, and then at private colleges, it's more like 70, 75% uh, finish on time with their degree. So some things like um, encouraging more partnerships between community colleges um, and employers, right? So um, here's an example. Uh, from Bunker Hill Community College and the Eversource Electric Power Utility Program, right? So linking uh, students with a job early on when they're actually getting hands-on training, providing wraparound uh, student support services. So a lot of students that are going to community colleges are first-generation college students. They are lower-income students. Uh, some of them have children. Some of them are working jobs. They're not sort of your fresh-faced 18-year-old white kid from the suburbs who's going to college, and so. Um, needing all sorts of uh, different services and where to find them on campus, right? If you've never been on the college campus before, it can be pretty confusing to figure out where you could even go to help, get help. Um, increasing dual enrollment between community colleges and high schools. So this is where high school students can take uh, courses at community colleges for free and get credit for them before they even walk in the door. So it helps in two ways. One, if it's cheaper to get your degree because you're already getting some of those uh, credits for free, and two, lets you know like what is actually required of you uh, to do work at the college level. Recommendation three is improving Boston's vocational and career pathways. So by teaching vocational education um, uh, very hands-on, and actually in Massachusetts, we have what's known as the Cadillac of vocational education systems. Um, so this is something we do very well across the state, although not universally well everywhere. Um, the thing that's um, difficult about our vocational system is that uh, it has a very long waiting list. So actually a study done by the Dukakis Center uh, last year, the year before, showed that at least 21 of the 33 schools had a waiting list. And because
because of that waiting list, that means they get to prioritize who gets admitted. And so the um, MCAS scores, the 10th grade MCAS scores for our vocational schools are above the state average. So they are essentially cherry picking the best students to go to vocational school. Half of them go on to a four year college degree, which is great, that's wonderful for them. But that means that because we have this waiting list, maybe not everybody who would benefit from a vocational education is getting access to that education. Uh, and then finally, the last recommendation is to expand English as a second language program um, so that immigrants can get into these high demand jobs. Um, compared to Boston, or to, compared to the US, we know that we're relying more heavily on our immigrant population to grow our labor force. Um, immigrants, you might not know, come from two very extremes of the education distribution in Boston. So probably most people think of those who do not have a high school degree, um, who maybe are working in food preparation or lots of the hotels or things like that. But don't forget that Boston also um, has a large graduate student population, um, many of whom are immigrants and who stay here, or also attracts um, immigrants from abroad who have advanced degrees, right? So I think we all have probably stories of someone that we've met who is doing maybe a, a manual type of job who actually has an advanced degree in uh, biochemistry or something like that. Um, and that's because it's hard to make those credentials translate into something when they get here without the help of an ESL program where they can learn some English skills, write a resume that looks like what an employer is anticipating and be able to go out and get a job that uses their skills. Lots of occupations require some level of English proficiency. Those are the better paying jobs typically. Um, and uh, we're actually doing a uh, report with the Boston Foundation that's surveying English uh, language programs here in Boston. And it turns out that only 10% of the programs we have here um, are focused on uh, meshing uh, English language learning with workforce development. Um, and that's sort of a key component of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. It also makes a lot of sense if the end goal is for you to get a job, to be learning English in the context of a job. Did you have a question? was about the demographics of the people teaching. Um, and so these programs vary really widely from, like here we featured um, Jewish vocational services that are very large community-based organization, right? They, they, they are like the gold standard of workforce training with ESL. They have very trained staff, it's the same staff, it doesn't turn over. Uh, demographically, it's actually a mixture, it's not all white, it, they, they have a fair number of immigrants who um, work for them. Uh, but then that ranges all the way down to these community-based programs you find at your public library, where somebody is volunteering their time. Uh, that could be anybody um, you know, who, who might be from any demographic or educational background, who might even have no certification or, or uh, training in how to provide ESL services, but you know, it's doing it as part of their community. So it really varies, and I think that's kind of a little bit of what the struggle in this sector is. You know, we want people to have access to this, but then also, can we, can we develop some more capacity where we think it might be needed? So, so that was my spiel on education. That's act one, thank you. Um, <laughs> I was gonna now pass the baton uh, to my panelists, so I'm gonna pass it to Chris first because he can tell us more about what Wayfair is doing in reference to thinking about how to hire and maybe thinking less about the credential that people have and more about the skills that they have. So, uh, thanks, Alicia. So, I, I run the uh, campus recruiting and early career hiring team at Wayfair. So, we're a team of about 25 people, and we go to over 100 schools across the country and we recruit from uh, top programs like Northeastern, where I'm just very proud of our co op program here. Uh, so, it's very nice to be here today and excited to uh, talk a little bit more about what we're doing off campus to actually build our program beyond just the uh, kind of traditional bachelor's, master's, and PhD hiring that we've always done. Um, and I think, I think just to give you an overview, the, the way that we look at hiring, we essentially have two tracks within early career. We hire into business roles, we hire into technical roles. And when we actually look back at the, uh, the hires that have been successful over the last couple of years, we notice that um, actually we don't necessarily need a bachelor's degree or a master's degree to perform well within the roles that we, we place people in. 
we see there's some overlap in uh, the types of roles and the, the skills required. Um, but when we, we dig a little bit deeper, there's actually some underlying traits and skills that we value very highly um, that are not necessarily correlated directly with uh, spending four years getting a bachelor's degree. And we look at you know, grit and determination, communication, um, the ability to you know, show up on time and put the work in, and we, we highly value those. But also as a, as a team, we highly value diversity within, uh, within, within the organization. And, and that's something that really, from the ground up, is, is becoming a lot more important uh, as the company continues to scale and continues to have more of an impact over the great Boston area. Um, so more granularly, what, what we're doing to help build out those programs is um, figuring out where we can look at non-campus sources for both business and technical track. So if you look at the business track, first of all, um, for, for the last couple of years, we've had a partnership with the Year Up program. Um, so for those that don't know, it's a six month training program for underserved young adults, aged 18 to 24 in the Greater Boston area. And they, they bring in a, a, around about 200 people every, every six months. Um, and so we've been hiring people from Year Up into a six month internship um, with uh, different teams around the organization. Uh, so a year ago, we, we had 10 people as part of that program. And in this, this current uh, program, we have about 15. Um, and the plan is to continue to grow that moving forward. Um, but one thing that we did start to look at is, uh, as we were planning for this cycle is how similar the year of program is to the co-op program, the, the Northeastern model. And so one of the things that we've decided to do is offer the same kind of programming, the same kind of opportunities to the year of interns that we offer to our co-ops. So they'll go through the same orientation, the same induction, uh, they'll go to the same events. Um, we do you know, a whole six months worth of um, uh, executive speaker series and networking opportunities. And our goal with that program is to essentially give everyone the, the same opportunity to get an, an offer to work full-time at Wayfair uh, after graduation. And we've actually seen a lot of success in the first pilot of that program and really look forward to continuing to build that moving forward. I think combined with that on the business side, um, in addition to hiring a lot of full-time employees, we also hire uh, a lot of interns um, into the 10-week summer internship program in Boston. And I think some, some of the studies have shown that, um, that offering an internship within a corporate environment actually really builds the, the kind of long-term career prospects for anyone who has the opportunity. And so we're looking beyond the traditional schools that we've targeted to offer these internships to, to community colleges, to non-college um, sources and we've actually partnered with Boston Chamber uh, on a new pilot that is uh, running it's, it's kind of quietly running in the background right now as we're, we're running through the initial pilot program um, but our goal through that is to offer an, a, a way for people with without a traditional um, four-year college background to apply for an internship using a program that actually strips away all of the um, uh, any gender identity any uh, ethnic or race identity, any kind of extracurriculars that are not necessarily relevant to the, the skills and the ability for the person to perform. And so we're really excited to see the, uh, the, the output of that program it's using a platform called Skillist. Um, and so uh, we have a lot of things in flight right now that we're going to start to see results from this summer. Uh, then on the technical side, um, we've always offered the software engineering role to people from both campus and from uh, boot camps. And we've seen over the last few years uh, the bootcamp pipeline really starts to grow. But then when we drill into the hires we're making from boot camps, we've seen actually a lot of people don't necessarily have a, a four-year bachelor's degree and certainly don't have a four-year bachelor's degree in computer science like we, we require for our kind of core role. And so uh, we've been looking at how do we build that program out even further. And so we've partnered with another uh, initiative called Apprenti um, and we have uh, actually just started the, uh, the kind of first batch of our Apprenti hires. So we sponsored five students to go through um, a boot camp that started on Monday, uh, and at the end of the boot camp, they will join Wayfair as full time employees with guaranteed employment for a year, um, learning a, a software engineer salary, which is um, you know, very good in the, in the Great Boston area. And so, we, we believe that that's a, a way to meaningfully hire more people that don't have a, a four year uh, bachelor's degree. And then, alongside the apprentice program, we started to look at other boot camps to partner with to essentially grow that program faster than we can grow uh, working directly with nonprofits. And so um, we've, we have uh, eight uh, resilient coder alums currently working. And if, you, if you're not familiar with that program, it's, uh, it's designed to help basically have a mandate that they will only train engineers of color into uh, software engineering roles. 
And so we, we now have eight full-time software engineers hired from that program working at Wayfair, and we're partnering closely with them to figure out how we can continue to build and grow as the needs for software engineers in Boston increase, which we see kind of a, a, a huge need for moving forward. Um, and so we're really excited about all these programs. We're in the very early stages right now, um, but uh, it's, it's really exciting to see uh, the kind of the output and, uh, and what we have ahead in, in 2020.
court involved or at risk of being court involved to provide transitional employment. Um, so they have an opportunity to do summer jobs programs along with development that helps them make a longer term plan. Um, I think there's really interesting collaboration among not just city government and the BTS, but involving also kind of large employers in the city thinking about those opportunity zones and thinking about like where are the gaps. So some of the gaps that we've identified um, are in particular like we have a lot of training programs that people can do. Um, what happens when you exit a training program? What's the next step for you? Um, clearly a lot of people need to do multiple, you know, might need to take multiple paths before they end up on the one that is a fit for them. And especially if you're talking about somebody who's 17, 18 years old, um, not a lot of people are doing the job, you know, at 40 that they thought they would be doing when they were 17. So folks might need a chance to, you know, do one training program and then have a warm handoff to kind of their next step. So that's an area we're trying to do some work right now. Um, in terms of high school students, um, one initiative that we fund through our office is the Tuition Free Community College Initiative, which if a student is a Boston resident who graduates from high school or gets their GED high set and they are Pell eligible, we will pay that last dollar for them to attend community college tuition free for up to three years. Um, and then they can transfer and do a four year program. Um, so those are kind of two main initiatives. We touched a little bit on vocational training. Um, there's some interesting work being done within BTS on dual enrollment specifically for kids who are in the career and technical education pathways. Um, so overall, they have a goal of making sure that every student who is in part of a CTE program graduates with some sort of certification. Um, and also they have a goal of dual enrollment so that they graduate with at least 12 credits. Um, which is great if you're trying to get a job and also really an important indicator of whether you're likely to be successful once you move on to college. So, um, so I think those are kind of like the biggest initiatives. And we're gonna talk about youth summer jobs in a little bit, which is another huge area of work for us. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, I think what we see is people are actively really looking. Um, there are, in general, to speak to what we do, we don't do training in our office per se. We fund organizations to do training, and we really believe that it's our job to get the money out to the organizations that have um, the connections to be able to do that work. We do fund a number of organizations directly for that outreach work, um, and we look for um, partners who are going to kind of leverage their existing relationships to get folks in the door. Um, I think if we just put up a sign on City Hall that said, like, job training program here, not a lot of people would come and, you know, walk through the door. Um, but if they know that it's a program that's through their local community center or they're recruited through a church that they might be a part of or, you know, a lot of these organizations have really deep histories in Boston and so they're very well known. We work a lot with union um, job training programs that are coming out of um, collective bargaining agreements. So that's a source where they have like a huge constituency that's looking for training. One, have they overcome that yet? And two, how do you make sure that they really, I'm assuming that you see many, it's very easy to tap into the lower handling group people who are most likely to be successful at jobs. Yep. But I'm talking about people that excuse my lack of appropriate description. Uh, I have called what? What I'm trying to get around is this. Uh, companies advertise, for example, that there's a shortfall of labor ready workers. But we see a lot of people who are unemployed. Mm -hmm. So what exactly, and I'm talking about real practical things, but what I'm trying to do is to learn how these things are done from a practical standpoint so that I can understand them. Mm -hmm. You 
Jesus, for example, talked about diversity. Can you give me some numbers as to who you've been employing? And because people talk, they just talk. I would love to be able to give you some numbers. <laughs> um, I'm afraid that, afraid that I don't really have any numbers to share. Um, what I what I can say though is we we are making a you know strong commitment. You asked you know, what 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 do we do to kind of bridge that gap between the number of people that are unemployed and the jobs that are available. I mean, we, we have maybe a thousand jobs currently available at Wayfair. What we're seeing is, is, is the skills gap in the, in the market, and that's one area that we're trying to solve for. Now, we have limited resource to actually train and develop people. So what we're, we're looking to do as an organization is partner with different agencies, either within, mostly within the Greater Boston area, to help identify um, how can we develop the skills gap so that we, we can offer full-time jobs? So we, we have to, we have a fiduciary responsibility to shareholders ultimately. So we, we have to hire people to, to do the job. Um, but what we can do and where we can lean in is to help those organizations really understand um, what are the kind of core skills that they should be training. So we partner with, we, we partner with Gear Up and have a very healthy relationship with them. Um, we provide a lot of feedback on, on not only what are the current jobs available that, um, that need to be filled, but where is the market going and what does is, what is the jobs market look like in, in two years' time so that they can start developing a curriculum to train people aged 18 to 24 is their core, core, core market to help, uh, help develop that skill set uh, for us to continue hiring in the future. These, these questions for me? Yeah. Happy to answer more. So, what, well, why are, so you mentioned a few times uh, hiring people from Europe and getting them that's wonderful. Well, what about the people in Boston? So um, it's, it's probably my accent. Um, so Gear Up is the name of the organization. Oh, okay. So it, it's <laughs> you may <laughs> see. <laughs> I, <laughs> oh, yeah. I have this problem all the time. I'm, I'm an immigrant, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so the Year Up program. It's like open classroom moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so the, year, the Year Up program is is actually a, a, a great model, and it's something we're trying to replicate ourselves. So. It's, it's a six month training program that takes place in Boston and so people from the great Boston area um, and it trains key skills and we then commit to hiring people. We, we actually pay year up to train uh, those young adults and then we commit to hiring them for at least six months after graduation with the goal to make a full time offer to, to them in the end. Okay. <laughs> the car, <laughs> yeah. So it's some, I just want to confirm we, we're definitely looking at that. I can't announce anything yet because we're, we're literally in, in the process this week of, of looking into how to support that. I'll hand over. Well, I wanted to first this gentleman in the gray shirt. I, want, I know you had asked a question that I feel like I didn't answer, but on the soft skills question, and it's such a great segue to talk about youth summer jobs because I think that's really important. We actually don't fund a lot of soft skills training things in the adult workforce development space, um, just because of our sense that this is public money and it needs to go to a job training program where you have the ability to get a job at the end. So we want to see that performance on the part of the organization doing the training that they are providing something that's gonna you know, be worth the time that people are investing in it. Um, and so that certification and job training pathway is something that we've really refined over the years because sometimes the soft, I'm not, there's a lot of wonderful soft skill training programs in Boston, um, but you know, there is some of it too that is maybe um, a little harder to quantify and doesn't necessarily lead you into a job, which is the thing that people really need, right? Um, in 
terms of the question about like, you use the phrase hardcore and fluid, right? And I, um, I, don't, I mean, it's such a, we're in such a moment where the labor market is so tight that we actually do see folks who are in the training programs now who have so many barriers to employment. And some of the barriers are related to the structure of our public safety net system, that it really is, um, that many of the ways that public benefits are structured, not just in Massachusetts, but nationally, are a real impediment and disincentive to economic mobility. Unfortunately, that's not something that we can, you know, that we really control at the city level, not just to throw up our hands, but just to say, like, I think that's something that we recognize is an issue that's out there. Um, there's also, I think, a way that we have to meet people where they're at with training just like every other day in life. So if somebody is at the point where they have, you know, um, a new baby or a two-year-old, they're less, it, we've done research about people who, once your kids are in school, you're much more likely to stick to a training program and complete it, which makes complete sense because once you have, you know, reliable, predictable schedules for the rest of your family, you're able to dedicate the time that you need to your own training. So. I don't have a particular answer for that. I think it's definitely an area where we would love to see, you know, more research or engagement or really thinking about that because it's a safety problem. In terms of the unions, I mean, absolutely, there's a mixed track record there to be sure. Some of the unions that we work with are like service unions that are really led by people of color, in many cases mostly women of color, and they have, um, you know, the Local 26 that was on strike for a lot of the year last year. Part of their demand is around um, funds for training programs, and they have built really excellent culturally competent training programs that also have partnerships with employers. Um, we work a lot with the, the building trades, and they have a program to, um, to think about how do you build pathways into building trade apprenticeships because they're so, you know, kind of high wage jobs um, that are going to be successful for people who haven't historically found a home in the building trades. Um, so we really make sure that we resource that work is important for us. I don't know if we have 100% the answer, but it's something that we want to, you know, continue to engage on. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to
CMP progress on training programs, they mostly focus on um, training people for entry level positions. Um, so I don't have a lot of insight into how the organizations do that, but obviously the city of Boston itself employs 17,000 people, so a big goal that we have is to make sure that our practices as an employer reflect the values that we want to see. We actually did a big audit of our um, hiring and advancement to see, you know, at what point, you know, people get interviewed, they get hired, if they have a job for a certain amount of time, do they get promoted, are there reviews, you know, consistent, you know, or are there racial disparities and kind of like those later career patterns. So that's a big analysis that um, I know some of my colleagues at City Hall have been, been engaged on. And I think really being able to reflect back on that and have a process in some way is important. Um, our job postings, for example, don't require a bachelor's degree or they don't require a certain education level. They'll always have something that says, you know, bachelor's or you can substitute X years of service or X years of experience. So I think there are some really concrete ways we're trying to develop tools for managers to, you know, have those conversations internally. But for us as an employer, I think we still have a ways to go just like every other big employer in the city. So I love the question that was out there about high school students and thinking earlier on that because it gave me a nice segue to like linking these things together that might not have uh, been there before. But so Act Two, we're going to talk about um, the summer jobs program uh, that I've been working to evaluate with the city of Boston. Um, so here's Mayor Walsh comes out every spring around this time of year saying, "Employers, summer jobs is important," and what he's saying here is. Summer jobs offer our young people the opportunity to gain great experiences beyond the classroom. We're all in this together. I'm asking private sector companies in Boston to join the city, already participating in companies, nonprofits, community-based organizations to make a commitment to this year's program. It's good for our youth, it's good for the businesses and part of our talented young people, and it's good for the city of Boston. And so notice he's not just saying it's good for youth. <laughs> he's saying it's good for companies too. Um, and I can certainly attest, having been on the other um, side of the spectrum, uh, having worked in the private sector before, that for a lot of um, employers, large employers in Boston, the summer job program is their first step at diversity. So um, uh, some of the places that I've worked at, um, people of color who are uh, senior, who are in management, many of them walk through the doors as summer job kids. They worked there for several years as summer job kids, then they went to college, they came back for summer internships, and then they persisted. And so um, it, there's a lot of organizations that uh, partner with the summer job program who uh, help improve diversity by even building onto their summer job program, um, by doing college advising uh, and building other supports around it. So it, it's definitely an important piece there. Um, how can summer jobs improve youth outcomes? Yeah. The summer job program has been going on since the 1990s. That little anecdote I gave you was from my experience having observed where people are. We don't really track um, summer job kids that's through large employers, but that's something you might get to. Nice. What was your summer job? I actually was part of the second UIF family. There we go. 
stubborn job alumni right in our midst. Uh, I was a camp counselor. What were you? just for fun. Um, and when he came back in the summer, this is my oldest son, not the greatest scholar, and he'll completely admit to that. And I said, so what's better, working in the pasta factory or going to school? And he's like, oh, going to school. And I was like, yeah, you should get those grades up, Dan, so you, know, you can get to where you want to go. So uh, you know, knowing, knowing what's out there. Um, and then improving behavioral outcomes. So this is where that soft skills part comes in. Uh, there's a lot of community engagement. Uh, the program is structured where there's mentors, um, there's uh, a job supervisor, and those job supervisors get rated at the end of the summer. There's feedback about that. Um, so building some of these relationships um, with your peers and also with some adult mentors. So just to give you an idea of what the program is, um, any resident age 14 to 24 of the city of Boston can apply. Um, kids work about 25 hours a week. It's a six-week program. Starts right after July 4th, goes until the middle of August. They get paid the minimum wage. That's an important part of this because it's actually a large cash transfer program that I think people don't realize. So 50% of our kids pay a household bill. And I don't mean like they pay for their sneakers. I mean they're paying a utility bill. They're helping to pay rent. They're paying their cell phone. I would love it if my kids would pay for their cell phone, right? So um, big cash transfer. They can either be in a subsidized position, so um, through the PIC or one of these um, other organizations, you might be placed to work with a community-based organization, or you'd be placed with a private sector employer like um, the State Streets and the MGHs that we mentioned before. Um, you also get 20 hours of additional training um, using uh, this career readiness curriculum called Signal Success that was developed by um, the state that covers things like how to write a resume, how to interview, um, how to search for a job online, um, how to, you know, what are the different career pathways you might be interested in. Um, also teaches some financial capability as well. And you can also participate for multiple summers. Although, um, two of these organizations that are listed up here, so ABCD, the PIC, YCD, and YOU are the ones that administer the program. Two of them use random assignments. So there's a lottery to get in. Um, and so if you want to participate in multiple summers, it's not necessarily guaranteed. So um, for ABCD, I think their program is called Summer Works. Um, each organization runs their own um, uh, enrollments, and part of that is because they're all serving a slightly different population. So ABCD usually serves younger kids, like your 14 to 15 year olds, who really just cannot get hired. So you might think when they were 14 to 15, nobody was going to hire them because uh, there's some restrictions in terms of the kinds of jobs that you can do, and there are plenty of 16, 17, and 18 year olds. Um, the PIC is where you find most of the private sector jobs, so they're actually located in the Boston Public Schools, um, and they will meet with students and help them match up with a job. Uh, youth Employment and Engagement, that's the big BCYF program that runs, where they place like 3,000 kids every year. And then YOU, Youth Options Unlimited, they are a quite involved program. So each one is sort of serving a different part of the market, and kids move around. So you find a 14 and 15 year old trained at ABCD one summer, then apply to the PIC the next summer when they want to private sector job. Yes? Well, I might be uh, a little ahead of other kids, uh, so like, isn't there a channel and it's like mapping out the interpersonal skills and the skills of lifelong learning? And so I'm thinking about like the soft skills and like quantifying like the ability, so for instance, like maybe we quantify that, you know, the, the moments we run after, right? Like are we able to think about jobs and quantify those ourselves and what kids learn? Yes. Um, 
maybe not as precisely as you want, that would be my choice. So what did we do? Uh, so we're gonna study uh, both the, what happens over the summer, that's what we're gonna call short-term uh, program effects. So we have a pre-post survey. Uh, kids take it at the beginning of the summer and then at the end of the summer, and it covers a bunch of things. It covers your job readiness skills, it covers your academic aspirations, it covers a bunch of soft skills and community engagement um, as well, and some uh, financial capability as well. Um, and then we link those things that happen over the summer in terms of the short-term stuff off of the survey, we link that to what we call these longer-term outcomes that we see happen over the next 12 to 18 months after you participate in the program. So we get administrative records on uh, criminal arraignments, uh, school performance, and employment and wages, and then we link those two. So what is, what is it that you learned in the summer that's correlated with improvements uh, in these other things down the road to try to understand some of the mechanisms for the program? So some of the short-term improvements that uh, you were asking about in terms of soft skills. So some of the things that we looked at were things like community engagement. Um, Yeah, no, we, nothing's been sort of linked up to sale. And, and actually this program runs completely, like not completely, but largely independent of BPS. So, you know, the, uh, the pick is sitting in, the, in BPS to find kids, right, to get en or enroll them in the program. But um, this program's funded by the Office of Workforce Development. It's run by those four intermediaries that we were talking about. Um, and so the, what I'm gonna show you today is sort of how we've been evaluating the program over the last three years. Um, but there hasn't been like a, as comprehensive of a deep dive like what sale does. Um, so some of the things that we looked at in terms of uh, community engagement were feeling like you had a lot to contribute to the groups you belong to, uh, that you're connected to people in your neighborhood, you felt safe walking around your neighborhood. Um, one of the things to note here is that this is happening across the board. So it's not just uh, males or females, it's not just whites or blacks or Hispanics. Um, and I found this kind of striking. As an economist, we don't get these kind of results all the way across the board. Um, and so the fact that it's having such a big impact on uh, both community engagement as well as these social skills, like uh, managing your temper, um, resolving conflict with a peer, I mean, there it's not maybe as across the board, but uh, that was surprising to me. So when we first started this work, I was looking for like, you know, improvements in job readiness skills and employment. I wasn't looking for improvements in these soft skills, and they're actually some of the biggest effects that we find. Um, we also find improvements in terms of uh, future aspirations <laughs> and academic skills. Yeah. I'm so curious, like, what are the criteria that we look for to, um, in connection with role models? Can we go back to yeah. three? Yep. Yeah. I, I find it very intriguing that how am I going to find role models when most of the time what I go to, most of the people I go to, lower echelons of the
So in the previous presentation, we had a whole breakdown by race in terms of BA versus non-BA, right? And here I don't have the descriptive statistics because uh, they're not as shiny and as exciting, but I can tell you that 60% of the participants in the summer job program are black, 30% are Hispanic, and that leaves only 10% to be white or Asian. So this program is largely serving um, people of color, students of color. Um, I forget what the other, oh, in terms of role models. So what's interesting is we've actually changed this role model question over time. So it used to be we asked if you had a positive role model and everybody answered. So what these numbers are, are these are the difference between the treatment group and the control group. The treatment group are kids who filled out an application and they got randomly selected into the program. The control group are kids who filled out the application and randomly did not get selected into the program. And so we can compare these two groups because they were both uh, applying to the program and it was just by chance who got into the program and who did not. And so we're comparing the experiences of the treatments versus the control group here and finding, for example, that um, kids in the treatment group are 15.6 percentage points more likely to feel like they have um, something to contribute to the groups that they belong to. We find no difference across the board for positive role model, because if you just ask that general fluffy question, everyone says they have a role model. Since then, we've revised it, and if you ask who is your role model, there's a huge difference. Kids in the program during the summer will say a job mentor or supervisor is their role model, whereas kids who are not in the program will say like a teacher or their parents or something like that. Yes? Yeah, sure, so the, the options for the survey kind of vary depending on the question, but for, for these kinds of questions, like do you have a lot to contribute to the, what you, uh, the groups you belong to? It's a Likert scale, like one is, you know, I don't agree very much, four is I agree a lot. So this is the percentage point difference between the percent of kids in the treatment group who agreed strongly that they have a lot to contribute to the groups that they belong to compared to the percent of kids in the control group. So it was roughly, I think, 75% of kids in the treatment group said that they have a lot to contribute versus 60% um, of kids in the control group. That's where you get that difference of 15 percentage points up there. So it was, so you said, so it's a Likert scale of four, you said? Like there's like four yes. options? Okay. Yep, for that question. Some questions are not asked exactly that way. So for example, do you plan to work in the fall? It's like a yes or no thing. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's kind of like the, are you pregnant question. It's not a, I think so, or, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, and in terms of that question, <laughs> you didn't know open classroom came with sex education, did you? Um, the lifelong learning, that's right. So in terms of that question, do you plan to work in the fall? This is one place where we find our kids uh, are less likely to say they're going to work in the fall. That's because they just worked in the summer. And also, if you're in the summer job program, you know what happens to your job at the end of the summer? It ends, right, compared to if you had gotten a job on your own, it might continue into the fall, right? Um, so that's, that's one difference. But here, here's a really interesting uh, distinction. So between the treatment and the control group, there's a large difference, positive difference, uh, for kids in the treatment group saying that they plan to go to a four-year college or university or to attend a two-year college. Yes? So the summer job program um, serves 10,000 kids in the city of Boston every summer. Um, and then the year-round employment program, so for example, ABCD has a year-round employment program that some kids might roll into, but I mean, it's like maybe 50 kids. I think it's less than 50 kids. They're, they're fairly small. Um, 
And then also you have to be kind of careful with year-round employment programs because the, the evidence on those are somewhat mixed in terms of how they affect school performance. So working a little bit might be good and help you pay the bills and actually maybe keep you structured in terms of your time. Working too much starts to interfere with school. So ABCD is very careful. They actually pair up their kids with tutors and they demand your report card and they keep track of your grades. And if your grades start to suffer, they're gonna cut back your hours to make sure you get more tutoring. But you know, not every part-time job is gonna be that. Um, in terms of job readiness, uh, our, the kids in the treatment group outperform the control group in terms of um, most of the job readiness skills. Like, do you know how to prepare a resume and a cover letter? And um, have you asked an adult for help finding a job? This is good because there's that career readiness curriculum that's supposed to teach kids this stuff. And so we were kind of reassured that this actually showed up in terms of what did you learn this summer. Um, okay, so long-term outcomes. So this is coming from administrative view. So this is not self-reported. Uh, this is me going to uh, the Department of Criminal Justice and Information Services, getting criminal justice records um, for all of the treatment and control group, going to DCS and then uh, Division of Unemployment Assistance as well. And so here's where, you know, you might feel like, well, that was self-reported data and I might want to plead to like the program administrators and say I learned this. Here there's, there's none of that because it's reported by um, the agency. So criminal justice records, we find a 30% um, a reduction in violent crime. So over here on the left-hand side, this chart is showing you um, the difference between the treatment and the control group in terms of the number of arraignments per youth. So arraignments are when you have to go before the judge and get formally charged. So these aren't arrests and they're not convictions. They're the thing in between. But by the time you get to a judge, fairly serious, right? Um, so we are picking up some kind of criminal justice activity. So significant reduction in terms of violent crime as well as property crime on the order of about 30%. The other thing that's interesting is this doesn't happen during the program. Right? One of the key uh, motivations for the summer job program was keep kids off the street and keep them out of trouble. Do you know what hours they're working? Like eight to two. When do you think crime happens? Most criminals aren't really running around between eight and two. <laughs> and a lot of it happens at night. Um, and so actually, this is showing you the difference. That, that solid line is the difference in the number of arraignments between the treatment and the control group. And so to see zero there, that zero line, you want to get further away from zero to show an improvement. And you can see that box there is where the program is happening. There's no improvement during the summer. Summer is a high crime time. People still have opportunities. When it happens, when we get that difference happening between the treatment and the control group, is cumulatively over time. That sort of suggests to us there's some kind of change in behavior that's going on that carries on beyond me uh, preventing you from running around with your friends. And then we try to link this back to the stuff that I just showed you from the survey. What is it that you learned in the summer that's correlated with that reduction in crime? So the green bars here are kids that had uh, a reduction in terms of the number of crimes per youth. The black um, uh, is showing you kids that did not have an improvement in that. Uh, and this is showing you uh, in terms of managing emotions, resolving conflicts with a peer, and asking for help, highly correlated with reducing crime. The other things on the survey, like improving your academic aspirations, not really correlated with a, a reduction in crime. Those are probably not the same kids. Uh, in terms of learning job readiness skills, there's a whole literature on, you know, um, does a, does a um, whether or not a job stops, a bullet can be stopped by a job, right, because we're giving people more economic opportunity. That doesn't seem to be reduced uh, or correlated with this reduction in crime. It really has something to do with soft skills and community engagement where people are either putting themselves in different situations or they're reacting differently in those situations. School records. Um, we find a large and significant improvement in terms of attendance in the year following uh, participating in the summer job program. So it improves your attendance rate by about two percentage points. Um, and that actually improves your likelihood of being or attending school at least 85% of the days below which is considered chronically absent. Um, this largely comes from a reduction in days of unexcused absences, and that translates into a reduction in course failures. So whenever I run focus groups with summer jobs kids, I always ask them, what did you learn this summer? And the first thing they say is, well, geez, if you're gonna be five minutes late, you may as well not show up. That is a huge life skill that translates into showing up at school more often in the year following. 
And it turns out when you show up, you're much less likely to fail, right? You're at least gonna absorb enough knowledge. And then if you're less likely to fail, our next step is gonna be looking at graduation, right? The fewer classes that you fail, the more likely it is um, that you'll be able to graduate. Um, we find uh, the stats are bigger for kids who are age 16 and older, because those are kids who can drop out, and they also can drive, right? So they have more opportunity to not be at school. Um, there's also an improvement for kids who have limited English. So if you've had a summer job, you've probably learned some English on the job that's helping you out uh, in the year after. And also uh, a an, uh, positive improvement for um, low-income kids who are on public assistance. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, like, are the, in the case surveys, ask the students about like, the questions of like, the companies they work at in terms of like, how their spouse is at college? Yes. Yep, so there's, um, I didn't show you the results, but um, kids in the program, you know, they speak more highly about having a supervisor who's engaged with them. Um, their satisfaction with the job is higher. They feel more prepared to have their next job. So there's definitely a whole bunch of questions around that. And then, like, feedback. Like, so, like, valuing that, that maybe the job is learning new things and doing some things. Like, because one of the things that, like, I know how to work professional or hire or something, I feel comfortable. And one thing that I Yeah. Some of the reports around like, well, if I don't feel like my hair is appropriate, how would I answer this question about like whether I feel like I know the appropriate clothing if like I'm worried about my right. hair? And I know it's not explicit, I don't right. know like how it is, but I'd be curious about like, is there a way for the city to receive feedback from maybe like some job folks like talk to people on the job side of like, well maybe when we give advice like about hair, like it's not appropriate or like an opportunity Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I, I, we don't explicitly ask that on the survey, but I do know, so each of these partners, like ABCD and YDE, they work very closely with where they place kids in jobs. Um, and they supervise that quite closely and they have deep relationships. And so there are some questions on the survey around, you know, how satisfied you are with the job. And then also like uh, the TIC has actually, uh, they use this work-based learning plan, which is sort of like a mid-course review sort of for, um, for how the student's doing, but it also is, again, another opportunity for them to talk to the employer. Um, so they get a little bit of this feedback, but I don't, I don't think it's systematic necessarily. And, and even like some of these things that I'm showing you, some of this can be related to learning soft skills about how to fit into these environments, right? So you, I think somebody raised this question earlier, and even that crime statistic that I showed you about the reduction in crime, I can't say that it's a reduction in crime. I can say it's a reduction in arraignments. But it could be the case that reduction in arraignments comes from, you know, you're out late at night, the cop stops you. Instead of saying, why are you stopping me? You say, I'm sorry, sir, I'm going home. I gotta get up for work tomorrow, right? Which is a completely different, no, but it's a completely different thing in terms of, right, like how, uh, no, in terms of how these things are playing out, which has been sort of raised in terms of like, well, how do you know this is actually a reduction in terms of what people are doing versus how they are navigating the system, which, I mean, it, it's it's the world we live in, but if you are a kid who's growing up in Roxbury, like, being able to navigate the system in a different way, or being able to fit in in a corporate environment, I mean, we would like to change the environment, but it's really slow. It's not changing very rapidly, right? The, the policing and the policing tactics don't change very rapidly, right? So. Talk a little bit, yeah. Say it again. Are three hours going to be available? 
to go to the alternative high school where they should have been encouraged them to stay in and find out what the ground reasons why they are not doing well. That's all part of the summer job program does. So like kids are getting introduced to uh, different types of jobs and either maybe they're having a menial kind of not great job like some of my kids have had and that makes them aspire to do something different, right? And stay in school and figure out what that is. Um, or they're actually seeing a career path like if, if they were fortunate enough to get one of the jobs at State Street or MGH or Fidelity or the Boston Fed or wherever, where they've seen a different career path and they've uh, learned what those credentials are, um, how to get there. Um, and I think, you know, BPS has done a lot in the last several decades to reduce the dropout rate. So I think the dropout rate is actually at the lowest point that it's been um, in decades. And some of what this does, right, so by teaching kids to show up, um, uh, can also lead to higher graduation rates, right? So our biggest effects are on that age 16 group because those are the ones who are most likely to drop out. Um, and this is showing having participated in the summer jobs program, they're less likely to. Um, yeah, I, I yeah. just want to jump in because I want to make sure we get to Act 3 yes. on your housing piece. <laughs> Okay, so just to wrap up the last part of summer jobs, it's a workforce development program, although we don't find a lot of effect on employment. Part of that is because kids are still in high school, right? So we haven't tracked them long enough to see their longer term outcomes. And the other thing is their summer job does end. But we do uh, find an impact for older kids, um, age 19 to 24 years, and particularly um, uh, black males, age 19 to 24, who see every time in the sum after the summer a bump up in terms of their employment. So those are the red circles there showing a higher employment rate for those in the treatment group, um, as well as a bump up in terms of wages in the summer after employment. And so this is helping that opportunity group that you were talking about, Katie, um, to gain some foothold. And as you were talking about, one of the things that we um, thought about in terms of the summer jobs program, in terms of policy, is how do you give that warm handoff mm -hmm. right to the next thing, right? So some of these kids are still in school, so like um, YOU will help kids re-enroll in school who maybe have dropped out, um, and they do that for a lot of their um, constituents. But then for the older students, can we get them into a, a job training program after this or into some kind of full-time employment? All right, Act 3, um, and I'm going to pass the baton to Callie. So one thing we're working on is uh, at the Dukakis Center is the Greater Boston Housing Report Card. So if you've been around uh, Boston and Boston policy for a while, you may look at this and see this familiar. We're trying to bring a new vision um, to this and sort of uh, re, uh, redesign what we're thinking about. We're looking at different sources of data than we have. We want to expand the dialogue in terms of who's talking about this. So the usual suspects turn up uh, often when this is released and we're kind of preaching to the choir. Um, so we'd like to expand that. Um, and to also try to keep the conversation going year round, right? Because it's kind of like a big event and then we all go home, and then we come back the next year, and we're like, oh, prices are still high, there's still not enough production. Um, so some of the things we're trying to do is putting the grades uh, back into the housing report card, 
um, thinking about the relative contribution of different communities around Greater Boston to affordable housing. Um, and so we have a number of uh, metrics that we put together. Uh, and then we're also collecting community level data on what cities and towns actually do. So what they actually produce, but also um, best practices. So what are some of the um, laws and regulations that are on the books that allow uh, housing production to occur? So uh, probably not too surprising to people in the room, we looked at uh, real household income um, among homeowners uh, that's been rising even through the recession, not so much for renters, right? We actually saw a decline in income for renters, uh, which is definitely contributing to a lack of um, affordability. There's a report that just came out from the Boston Fed yesterday, I think looking at extremely low income households uh, that shows that um, you know, part of the problem is affordability, the other problem is that wage impacts are rising. Uh, we look at housing cost burden, so this is if you pay more than 30% of your income uh, for rent or for a mortgage, you're considered cost burden. Um, and we can see that during the recession, uh, for um, those who are uh, homeowners, that increased during the recession, but now it's kind of returned almost to the level that it was before. Whereas for renters, that burden rose and has stayed high. And again, that's because a lot of low-income households are, are renter households and we haven't seen if we look at that um, uh, renter household uh, cost burden, we can see that it's pretty high across um, all of the different counties in Greater Boston. Um, and the cost burdens, not too surprisingly, are highest at the bottom of the housing distribution, meaning the cheapest apartments and the cheapest houses are where people are most cost burdened, right? If we look at um, the ratio of the income that's needed to afford um, housing for condos as well as single family homes. We can see low income households cannot buy anything in the Boston area. So these are people who are in the bottom 20% of the distribution. Middle income households um, can afford to buy a condo or a home in most of the counties except for Suffolk County, which is largely Boston proper. Um, high income households are the only ones who are non restricted how does Boston stack up to the rest of the country in terms of affordability? Uh, you can see we're one of the least um, affordable cities. We are uh, only beating out San Francisco uh, and New York. Uh, so uh, in terms of affordability across the board, not doing as well. Um, if we look at home values by metro region of the 25 largest metro areas, Boston ranks um, far down in terms of um, affordability home prices uh, by different tiers. If we look at uh, rents, rents in Boston are uh, second only to San Francisco and LA. We're actually beating out New York right now in terms of rents, which is kind of shocking. Um, housing permits. Housing permits tells us what's in the pipeline, what's being built. Um, and this is showing you uh, the permits that uh, are in the pipeline by single family, two family, three family, uh, and then five or more units. You can see it's a lot of single family uh, rather than multifamily housing, which is what we need uh, in terms of to make housing more affordable. Um, we're almost back to the levels of, that we were in 2005, but still not quite there. And we've had a big uh, dearth in terms of production in the middle. Who is permitting? So here's where we're putting some of the grades back in the report card. Uh, which are the communities that are contributing the most to housing production? If you look back in 2002, it was definitely more equal distribution than it is now in 2017, right? So that Boston box has just been growing and the suburb boxes have been shrinking. If we look at permitting activity, so how much are we building compared to other metro areas? We can see we're down uh, near the bottom there in terms of production, which is also contributing uh, to our affordability crisis because basic supply and demand in economics, if you restrict the supply, that's going to increase the price of something, right? So not having enough uh, housing in the pipeline is uh, keeping upper pressure on prices. Um, the other thing we're doing in the report card is trying to match up what we're doing in terms of production against what we need. And there's a couple different ways to measure this. One is, what do we need uh, based on how many households we're projected to have in the greater Boston area, right? Because every time we make a new household, they need somewhere to live, right? So if you can just project out uh, the population of households, you can project out how many housing units you need. And you can see that gray box is kind of our progress towards that goal. We're already behind, um, as we usually are. 
Uh, other goals that we have, um, we have the uh, housing choice goal that was uh, set by the governor. You can see that um, we're actually largely on track with that, although those goals are not as high as what's needed to meet uh, demand. In terms of the Metro Mayor's goal, so these, this was a goal collectively set by uh, the mayors in and around Greater Boston. Uh, you can see that uh, they are a bit behind in terms of that goal, and a lot of that goal is being met by Boston Harbor. <clears throat> and then finally, one of the ways that we have to increase housing production is something called 40B, which is a regulation that's been on the books since the 1960s, and requires that cities and towns have at least 10% of their housing that is considered affordable. Uh, by area standards, and if they do not, then a developer can come in uh, and build uh, without being restricted by the town. Um, and so you can see uh, units in terms of how much has been produced that's going to this 40B. 40B is not the answer to everyone's prayers, um, and it's a stick instead of a carrot, um, but it actually has been somewhat effective in producing affordable housing. There's still a lot of capacity, obviously, that's out there in terms of being able to build more um, in these 40R is another um, policy that the state uh, put into practice, I want to say, in the last 2004. 2004. Um, and this is to give communities an incentive to build transit oriented development. Um, it's a really smart policy, but has not been widely used um, so far. And then finally, a lot of what restricts uh, what gets built are a lot of the regulations that are on the books. So things around um, inclusionary zoning, things around being able to build multifamily housing, being able to build accessory dwelling units, um, all sorts of zoning lock restrictions that put these uh, boundaries, uh, these constraints in terms of what can be built. And so uh, you can see here, uh, this is just showing you whether or not they have an inclusionary uh, zoning bylaw by city and town. Um, quite a few do by now, but this wasn't always the case. And so we've been tracking uh, these kinds of best practices over time and seeing how they relate to production. Um, so I'm gonna actually hand it off to Callie Clark, who's from the Massachusetts Housing Partnership, so she can tell us some of the things legislatively that are coming online, um, because we're gonna be continuing this discussion in June when we release the housing report card with the Boston Foundation um, to talk a little bit about more what city and town are doing. Um, <laughs> Um, thank you for thanking me for the end. This was actually a really good conversation to hear. <clears throat> and it's good to hear also it sounds like a lot of people are from this inner core in Boston and actually my specialty is in the suburban community. Um, so that's, that's a little unfortunate, but I think what I can talk about is um, one thing that we would look at here is when we're talking about Boston, we're not talking about the city of Boston, we're talking about the metro statistical area. Um, and for this, it's about 157 communities um, in the region. Um, but one thing I do want to address in Boston specifically before we get into some statewide policy stuff and best practices and get to suburban and local level is that um, I don't think anyone would argue that housing in the greater Boston area or the entire state, the price of housing is out of control. Those numbers about how we are third to um, San Francisco and New York are terrifying. Um, and one thing that's been really interesting to hear about jobs and workforce and that I'm looking forward to having more conversations with is in a lot of other states, um, there's been a recognition of the role that economic development and housing, how the interplay that exists. Because if you can't afford to live close to your job, what are you gonna do, right? You commute an hour and a half. You have to go find another job that might be lower paying. Um, I think at the statewide level, we're thinking about how, what are solutions to that? Because that just doesn't make sense. Um, and I know specifically in the city of Boston, but also in neighboring communities, there's a lot of concern about gentrification and displacement. And those are all legitimate things that we should be worrying about and having conversations about. And one thing that I think the Greater Boston Housing Report Card is really going to be looking at is the city of Boston is doing a lot of great things. They're producing a lot of housing. But why is the city of Boston, why that chart, that, that cool looking chart, where it showed the difference between what was happening in 2005 and what's happening now, 
Why is that the situation? Um, so we have to wait for the report to hear more about that because we're crunching data, but that's something that we're really thinking about. Um, so Boston really is doing its fair share and a lot of other communities are not. And what are the policy implications there and how can we use data to tease out what should be done at the statewide level and at the local level? Um, unfortunately, here in Massachusetts, we are a home rule state. Um, a lot of power in terms of housing production or land use regulation lies at the local level. So there are communities that can have a lot of tools in their toolbox and produce housing, and that's something that we're looking at in terms of best practices. But there are also communities that can choose not to do that. And we're trying to, with the Greater Boston Housing Report Card, amplify that information to really push the conversation around housing policy and arm people with that information so they can say, why are you not doing this? I don't understand. Um, so I can talk a little bit about best practices, but also happy to answer any questions that come up. Um, a few things that we are looking at and we like to think about are, do you kind of have the tools in your toolbox that might lead you to be a more successful housing producer? Um, and again, I'm speaking in a suburban context where there is a ton of opposition to housing development, and that's not to say that there is not in a city context, but it's different. Um, so we think about best practices in terms of, do you allow multifamily zoning by right? And you would be, I was shocked um, having conversations with friends that said, oh, of course, we allow all different types of housing. And you're driving around and going, are you sure? People just don't want to build multifamily housing. I don't think that makes sense. Or you just don't allow townhouses, or you know, people just don't want townhouses. That's not been my experience. Um, I would want something like that. I would be interested in a multifamily development. I don't necessarily want um, a single family home on two acres. Um, but so one of the things that the Greater Boston Housing Report Card is really trying to highlight is that the the embedded um, institutional racism, as you mentioned, that are built into land use practices and how that is now being reflected in the housing production that we're seeing in Massachusetts. Um, so multifamily um, by right is one example. Um, when we're talking about 40R and um, housing around transportation into the existing infrastructure, again, that kind of makes sense. We have, as a state have invested a lot of money in that. Um, it makes sense, instead of getting in a car and driving to a parking lot or driving into the city, it would be nice if I could walk to a commuter rail stop if I don't want to live inside of in the inner core, right? Um, we start to think about other things that could be really useful in really like maybe Western Mass contexts, contexts like accessory dwelling units, which um, the, you know, once you get west of Worcester, the housing issues can be really different. Um, so thinking about, well, if you live in a rambling old Victorian in Williamstown, um, shouldn't it be easier to convert part of your home um, into smaller units? Or shouldn't it make sense that you can um, kind of subdivide your home and allow for accessory dwelling units? So we're, we're kind of collecting information and I think one thing that's really exciting about this is, um, as we should said, this is kind of a new take on the Greater Boston Housing Report Card. This is the first time that we're going to be tracking these best practices. So our hope is that in tracking best practices and combining that with production information, that we're really going to be able to say over time, do adding these tools lead to more production? Does more production lead to more tools? What, what's the real change? Um, and I think we have anecdotal examples of communities where you've seen political will to do things, um, but I think we're trying to figure out if someone wanted a roadmap for how their community could change for the better, what are some, what's some information we can give them to inform that conversation? Um, and then I can talk very briefly about what's happening at the State policy level, I don't want to keep you all too long. Um, there are a bunch of really great uh, legislative priorities. We are in a new legislative session. Um, actually, if you're interested in housing advocacy, especially advocacy for affordable housing, 
Um, I would recommend you take a look at um, what a different organization called CHAPA, the Citizens Housing and Planning Association. Um, if you go on their website, they actually have a list of legislative priorities. Um, and I can pull it up on my phone and read them to you, but I would really encourage you to take a look at that. There's a lot of really good information. And if you're interested in affordable housing in a statewide context, um, I would encourage you to look at that. The, the one bill I will call out in particular, that's something the state is really focused on is, so in a suburban context, we often have town meetings, um, sometimes representative town meetings, sometimes just whoever shows up decides what's gonna happen. Um, and one thing that we're kind of focused on is, sorry, time's up. Um, one thing that we're really focused on is that it's hard in that kind of context to make real change, right? Um, especially if you have maybe 20 people who show up to a meeting, just happens that the 15 people that show up are really opposed to something happening. Um, so the governor's housing choice bill would lower the threshold for voting on a lot of, kind of smart growth types of things like um, special permit, um, 40B projects, um, 40R projects. It would lower the threshold from a super majority, which is two thirds right now, um, to a regular majority, which would be 51%, which we're hoping we would start to see some real movement um, and would allow people that are interested in advocating for more housing would give them more of a space to talk about that at a local level instead of knowing, oh man, there's no way I can get two thirds, why didn't bring it up? Um, so. so, we're at the end of our time. I'm gonna ask the speakers to stick around so we can do some one-on-one -on -one with them as uh, long as, as they are available, but um, we have a round of applause for our panel. Alicia, thank you very much. Uh, next week, as I say, we're doing uh, Boston's Urban Mechanics and their take on issues of uh, race and resilience. And it looks like in the fall, uh, if you can spread the word, we're going to be focusing on the primary. So. Oh, my. <laughs> so with that, thank you all. And uh, those of you who want to come up and dialogue. Let's do it.